we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to click on, on speaker view, I guess, and I think that might be easier for you guys too, um, so that you can see the PowerPoint. Um, and what we're going to do today is um, we've done introductions. We're going to go through a bit of an overview of what environmental art is. Um, just a quick survey. We're going to show you some examples. Um, then we're going to talk about the collaborative environmental research and sculptural work that Lisa Beth and I are, and our collaborative group are involved with, Catching a Wave. And then we're going to talk about the projects that we're going to assign you. Uh, and some examples of people who have, students of ours who have done those kinds of projects before. So you get some ideas. Um, if you have any questions along the way, I think you can just unmute yourself and speak up. Right, Lisa Beth? Do you think that makes yeah, sense? Yeah, I think that's a great thing. And while we're doing it, you don't have to save them for later. Yeah, just we're super casual. We're just really excited to do this. We love environmental art and we're excited to share it with you guys and just again a thank you a big thank you to nate shepherd and all our sponsors for doing yeah. this I think it's such a great idea um so i'm going to leap right in see if i can get to go okay so lisa beth i'm going to move your picture over <laughs> We're still i don't even i it. only see you i don't you don't see me oh, maybe i maybe i'll see there. you okay now i can't see you either all right so what is environmental art and i think the first thing we want to share with you is that it is a huge range of artistic practices. Um, and we're gonna go over some of the different ways that artists are working um, in the field. Um, Rowan, I mean, Rowan, <laughs> I might say Rowan by accident. Um, Lisa Beth, did you wanna say something to start out before we go into the definitions? I think um, what I hope you'll find before the end of today is that it's a much broader field than you would expect. We're used to seeing, you know, a small clump of artists, but there are large group of people working in this field. Some of it's political, some of it's just beautiful for the sake of being beautiful. It's really about your relationship and you having a dialogue with the environment. As to how many people, you know, see it or experiencing it, or what's being said, it, that's entirely up to you. There's not really, at this point, there's not a right or wrong. You know, it's it's been studied, and of course people are writing a lot about it, but there's no, there are no real hard boundaries here. So hopefully you can just relax and enjoy it and make stuff. Yeah, and just to give you a context, um, you know, environmental art, which is kind of an umbrella term, there's lots of other words that people use for it, like eco art, um, uh, land environmental art. awareness art, land, land art, uh, but really humans, and that, that's a genre that gaining a lot of recognition now in contemporary art, especially with, you know, our, the world's finally waking up to, you know, the fact that our environment is in danger. So artists are also taking on that, that idea and addressing it. But, you know, humans have been involved in environmental art since the beginning of time. Uh, humans are naturally creative. We're all artists. Uh, and from the time of cave paintings uh, to, we're going to talk about, uh, uh, sacred mounds a little bit and this is nothing new but contemporary the art fine art world is now kind of really recognizing this as a as a genre similar to impressionistic art abstract art all the different genres that we've studied um, and now it's becoming its own thing so and and what we're going to be working on with you guys is aesthetic environmental art site-specific installations that are about how it looks so the beauty, the design elements and principles, but other artists are working with social and political issues. Some artists are making work that actually creates energy, um, solar panel art, um, art that, that, um, that uh, purifies water, um, art that creates awareness and educates. So there's a huge, huge um, field that, that people can get involved in, art that uses sustainable um, takes plastic out of the environment and creates objects of value out of it. So, so um, you can start to see that uh, it's, a, it's a huge field and a really exciting one and one that has a lot of professional development opportunities. Um, when I was thinking about environmental art, I was like 
okay, if I had to come up with one word to describe what's at the root of this, I would say it's about transformation. No matter what genre you're working in, you're, you're transforming a, or a space or you're getting somebody to transform thinking about how they're interacting with the environment. It's, it's, um, so when we talk about being encompassing ecological concerns, it's not only about that. There's a lot of, there's a whole genre now of climate art, climate-based art that's coming out. And it's like what Kristen was talking about. There's some that's, um, you're doing something to affect a change. Some of it's just about drawing attention. Some of this is just about documenting the change. You'll see a lot of people who will put, um, and you'll see examples of this a little bit later on, but put something out in the environment and document what happens in that place over time. And mm -hmm. so this recording, these are things that if you're somebody who gardens at all, you're experiencing already, you just may not be documenting it with intention. Yeah, and another thing to say is like, I, I can't see your hands right now, but think about if any of you have built a fort, you are an environmental artist. Anyone who's built a little boat, you know, out of bark and leaves and, and sent it down a river, you're an environmental artist. That is what we're talking about. It's creating. So I'm so psyched that we have some kids in the group because they're going to be way better than us to jump in to this stuff. So remember your childhood and what you played with back then. My cat is meowing, so I apologize. So <laughs> here's just some um, interesting images about, you know, we're really lucky in Wisconsin. We are one of the most uh, prolific areas for sacred mounds. Um, some of them are, are known. Uh, we know that they're burial mounds. Some are much more mysterious. We're not really sure, um, you know, what they were made for. They could be meeting spots, um, you know, areas of uh, sacred areas. Uh, built by a number of different indigenous peoples. Um, some of them really, really can't be appreciated. You're far, you know, uh, above them. There are some all over the city of Madison. And it's just a really interesting and unique, rich culture that's in our particular state. Another place in Wisconsin that you may not know about, which is a great place to visit, it's at the southern part of Door County and uh, has well, it's weird with the visual. I want to kind of ask you guys questions, but since I can't see you, let me see if I can get the, has you anyone- Go to gallery been, view, you'll be able yeah, to see. Yeah, now I'm there. seeing you again. Has anyone been there before? Is anyone familiar? No, okay. So, so I really encourage it. It's a great visit. I went there with a, a sculpture professor of an environmental art class that I took, and we talked about this formation. It's very much like a, an Aztec pyramid, which is not, not typical for our area. And a lot of the indigenous peoples in that area did not know much about the people who built this. They're thinking it was a northern trading post from South America, possibly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting and has a, it's a very interesting structure and has this kind of aura when you come upon it. Um, so, so architectural, uh, architectural land art, um, you know, art that, that kind of relates to rituals, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's, our state is really rich with this kind of work. Okay, so uh, let me see, I gotta click on this. So Robert Smithson, some of you may be familiar with his work, um, many may not. This piece is one of the iconic pieces for the group of artists during the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, who were making work that was extremely large and really kind of integrating the landscape into the piece. This, to give you a, si a sense of scale, uh, a big dump, and drive on this thing. So that kind of gives you an idea of how large it is. Those artists started making this kind of work because they were really reacting against the commercialization of art in the gallery scene at the time where paintings were going for huge amounts of money and they felt that artists were being influenced by that commercialization and it was it was kind of manipulating their artwork. So they wanted to make work that could not be bought so that it was more in a way on it or true or direct. And some of the other artists, um, really iconic and important artists in that movement who have kind of opened up and kind of prepared, uh, you know, contemporary culture for making this kind of work is Agnes Dean's. 
Do you in, pronounce it Dennis? I it's Hungarian, so I need to check with Joe. Um, I say Dennis, but it it may be Dean's. Um, but one of the reasons you're going to see this picture over and over, it's actually not her first earthwork. Her first work was uh, in 1968. And she's acknowledged as the first site specific performance piece that has ecological concerns. This was that was back in 68. This piece is actually in 82. And what she did is she planted a two acre wheat field on a landfill in lower Manhattan right next to Wall Street. So all those folks could look out from their, you know, sort of patriarchal, um, I forgot the word for our economy, but it's the money focused stuff and see nature. She brought in 200 truckloads of dirt. She dug everything by hand, cleared out the rocks and garbage, sowed the seeds. And so these are, this is an, it brings up an element that comes up a lot in environmental art, which is time. I know we touched on it briefly, but a lot of, a lot of what you're making this weekend, hopefully you'll leave up and you'll be able to see it change over time. You know, we're going to check back with you in a short while. But the work that you make may, it may disappear tomorrow and it may last for months. Uh, another artist in this, in this group of uh, land artists uh, is Walter Di Maria, who created a huge field in New Mexico of, I think there were about 20 foot tall steel poles that were installed in an area that had a lot of storms naturally. It's just an area that gets a lot of lightning storms. He was literally collaborating with the lightning because when he installed this, the lightning was drawn to the poles and you can actually rent time in a cabin there and watch the performance. You know, you got to get lucky um, that a storm will come through when you're staying there. But it, I love this piece because it's, um, you know, it's truly an artist working in direct collaboration with nature. And um, Ana Mendieta is another really well-known nature uh, environmental artist. There's actually a documentary in production right now. It should be hopefully out by the end of the year. Um, what she was trying to do is connect the female body in nature and that, you know, just thinking about that, your mind goes boom. There's so many connections you could discuss in terms of other people's relationship with the land, but she was really focused. She was Cuban American. And part of the reason she said she was doing it was to address the result of having been torn from her homeland in a way of reclaiming her roots and becoming one with nature. So she she worked a lot with silhouettes, but also a lot with placing her physical body in the land. And you'll see, if you look oh, her you know, huge wealth stuff. Oh no, you're good. Okay. Another artist that um, we really turn to, um, we were really fascinated by her. She's really, Stacey Levy, um, I believe she's in, yeah, Pennsylvania. She does a lot of work around raising awareness about water quality. Um, I really encourage you guys to look her up. She does some really fun pieces. She's collected water from all over Philadelphia and created installations where she'll let the water ferment so you can see which parts of Philadelphia have the contaminated water. And, and then she kind of makes connections with um, social status of those areas. So predictably the poor areas have the dirtier water and the, the that are more um, privileged do not. Um, and she is really great at kind of incorporating those ideas into visually stimulating and educational uh, installations. Um, uh, this will be especially nice for those of you who are textile artists. Edith Mus, oh, Kristen, help me. Musinier? Musinier. Musinier, thank you. She, the reason we included her is because most of what you've seen from so far has been about just taking from or with the environment. She's adding to the environment and she uses text to do this. She's based out of France. Um, I think that's something to think about too. We're going to ask you to do stuff with what's around you, but if you want to add stuff, you can. You just need to think about, you know, leaving things as you found them eventually or using something organic that can become one with the environment. And this is a great example of a site. I mean, all the works we've shown you, most of them are site specific, which yeah. means they really can't be moved anywhere. They are 
taking into consideration the attributes of that site, you know, the shapes, the, the water, the sky, the landscape, and then activating that space and adding to it with the, the materials that the artist is introducing. Um, something I'm sure you guys have all seen the memes going around on Facebook, but there is now scientific evidence that spending time in nature is beneficial to your health. So even though we're under quarantine, that doesn't mean you can't go outside. <laughs> well, for some of us. Yeah, most of us, I think, can now at least get our heads outside. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. I think even just sitting outside every day and paying, a lot of environmental art is also about paying attention. Yeah. Yep. Observing, taking the time, giving yourself the gift of time to observe what's happening with you and around you. So we're gonna just talk quickly about the, the collaborative work that Lisa Beth and I are, are working on. Uh, we work with an international group called uh, Catching a Wave. And I think we have the website on our workshop description. So you guys can click on that. Um, we, we were interested in trying to capture a moment in time uh, in, a, in a physical object. And Lisa Beth has a colleague working at, a, a scientist working at the Coastal Studies Institute in North Carolina, who is also in charge of their wave tank and is also a photogrammetry expert. Photogrammetry is simply put, a way of taking pictures from multiple spots in space uh, simultaneously a 3D object. So John mostly takes pictures underwater, he's a diver as well, of submerged uh, marine archaeology, like the, the submerged submarine, submarine vessel down, you see down below. Um, and we, we confronted him and we said, look, we have a, we have a challenge for you. Uh, can you. Do you think you can use your technique of photogrammetry to capture the, a wave? Uh, to capture the details and everything that, all the complexity that happens in a wave so that we can use it as a symbol of this moment in time. And we wanted to kind of explore how we could use that wave to talk about environmental change and ocean health. Lisa Beth, do you want to talk about this one? No, the, the group that we're working, I do, the group that we're working with also focuses on one of the United, the United Nations has sustainable development goals, thinking about how we as a global populace can move forward in a way that doesn't deplete and rather, you know, supports our earth, our environment, our cultures, our people. So our group tends to, we've got five SDGs that we're focusing on and one of them is life below water. And what happens is when we capture these waves, they become a vehicle for that conversation. So we're crossing the bridge a lot with artists and scientists and making a space for these conversations to happen. And usually more projects come <laughs> out of these, these um, exchanges. So when we did this, I uh, think Kristen, you got the grant for this one. We, we kind of trade off getting grants to support the work. This one, we've rented 16 cameras down from 24. And these cameras all had to be synchronized into a thousandth of a second because when you do photogrammetry, what it's doing is it's capturing all of the plot points around that object. So if you look on the bottom right, you see Kristen standing by the rig, the rig that um, Kristen's husband, Bernie, designed. What we did is we mounted the cameras on that rig. You can see that in the top right image. And then every time we took pictures, all of the SIM cards had to be taken out, fed into the computer, so if one camera's off, we don't have the image. So it took us, we had one week to do this and our Monday got knocked out because John um, had to go to some other meetings. <laughs> so we really had four days to do this and it got intense. And the biggest challenge is that photogrammetry doesn't like anything shiny and it doesn't like moving. And that's what water is, it's shiny and moving. So most of what our time was spent doing after we got everything synchronized was to try and figure out a way to capture the surface. We tried like confetti, we tried yarn, we tried netting. We were gonna getting ready to put dye in the tank, which you could see how much water's in there. That would not be a fun cleanup. And then John had this great idea. What if we tried sawdust, it should float. So Chris and I zipped out to the Lowe's and Kill Devil Hills, cleaned out their um, wood, wood uh, 
whatever you call it, where they cut the wood. They gave us all their sawdust. They thought we were nuts. And we came back and that's actually what worked. That's how we managed to get a surface image that all the cameras could focus on because they kept focusing on the bottom of the tank. And so these are the digital models that John created with the photogrammetry. And those became the resource that we used to create the 3D printouts that we used to make the glass models from. Oh, so we had one, yeah, you talk, Kristen. What? Um, I'll show you the models in a second. I was trying to zoom ahead to that. I think the main point in sharing this work with you is that um, as, an, as a professional, well, anyone who's working in, in environmental art, there's this great opportunity and unique opportunity to collaborate with scientists. And it enables us to do things that we, we could never do. I mean, this kind of technology has never been used for something like this before. And John wouldn't, was like, you know, I, he never thought of making a piece of art out of this. And since he's the educational outreach person at his uh, organization, he's using the work that we made to help um, kind of share in an education with an actual object, the kind of research they're trying to do to protect the environment out there. So it's a really symbiotic relationship and um, such a fun collaboration and new things came out of it that never would have happened if we were working on our own. Um, so we did take the, the process outside to the channel, so in a less controlled um, area, and we were able to kind of do some experiments there. When we get our next Next grant, we're going to go on a boat and uh, try to capture an actual ocean wave. That's the next uh, project. Plus, as artists, when do you get to like wear hard hats and uh, you know <laughs> work in a facility like this? Right, it's just super fun. We also get Chris to drive this drone around. What? Yeah, we had, we had to get in the water to make waves. The one day the Croatian Sound didn't have like wind blowing everything all over the place was the day we went outside. Um, so you have to be ready to work with the weather if you're gonna be an environmental artist. That's part, that's one of your collaborators. And also we had tons and tons of failure. I just wanna remind you that failure is part of the process. So don't be disheartened. Um, we yeah, went this is an example John went of the failure. Three printer heads. Yeah, three printer heads. It took 50 some hours to print the smaller model, 70 some to print the larger one. It's, it's just part of the process. So be nice to yourselves. <laughs> it's really important. So, yeah, and this, this piece on the left is what the printed model of the wave that from the photogrammetric process, photogrammetric process. And then the one on the right was hot cast into at a glass studio that's part of uh, East Carolina University. And then we also made some in the kiln. And we made these right in Amherst, uh, but it's exactly the same the same uh, wave. So, and then what we did was we embedded words and scientific images about the ocean, uh, microscopic organisms inside the wave, and then we light them from below. Um, and I think we made about 20 of them so you can walk through the installation. It'll be evolved into a more educational piece where there, there will be a sound component where scientists will be talking about their research, um, research that the general public usually doesn't have access to, but that really affects everybody because the ocean, we are dependent on the ocean and the ocean, ocean health is, is really, um, our health is dependent on the ocean health. And what we're trying to do with the sound is make these into community specific installations. So we're going into places and talking to people who have the relationship with the water for that place and then putting their voices in. That's what people who visit the installation can hear. Right. And another great thing about um, being involved in this field, uh, there's a lot of other people from other fields like sociology, um, political uh, groups, and, and lots of scientists who are engaged in this kind of research. So we've had the opportunity to attend a number of conferences, uh, one in Greenwich, one in Dublin at Trinity College, to kind of share this work and, and try to help other people think about how are you communicating this message about protecting the environment and can the arts, can you consider arts 
uh, the arts to be a, a, a great way to to connect and communicate with the general public in a, in a way that scientists are unable to through their research papers. Um, there's a picture, actually, I'll go to the next picture. Oh, that's Shona. Uh, Lisbeth, do you want to talk about Shona? Uh, Dr. Shona Patterson is a marine biologist. She's also got a PhD in coastal studies. And I met her when she was here at ECU. We actually met in a pub. This is where kind of knowing what you care about and being able to talk about it has a lot of value. Passion goes a long way. Of course, beer helps sometimes. But, they have um, a Shona, wave pool. <laughs> yeah, they have a, yeah. Our, this is like our next dream wave pool. This is in Cork, Ireland. And Shona, <laughs> Shona who loves to make faces for pictures, was there. Um, she's back in London now working at Brunel University. But she was up at Marai, which is their... Um, a lot of the environmental institutes are studying energy sources, wind energy, wave energy. You know, um, how can you channel what's around you instead of having to create and make more destructive things? So all the people in this picture are, this is the crew. So on the left, you've got Merle, who's a geographer. You have Kristen and I, Shona, of course. Um, the two women on the right are communication specialists. Aoife is, is with Mirai in Cork, and um, Hester is part of our close group. And she and Martin, who's on the left, are both also at UCC, which is University College Cork. And so, Martin's a coral specialist. He's a, he has a PhD yeah. in coral. And um, Shona is a marine biologist, but she started out counting sharks. <laughs> Yeah, so the conversations are fun, and it's kind of nice to expand your, you know, as artists, we tend to just stay with our own, and there's, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's also good to branch out, that's where some of the wonder and joy comes from, are these collaborations. One of the things we're trying to do is make connections. So connecting people with the ocean, connecting people with each other, and these handheld waves is the next of this project. They're cut from the digital waves that we had before, and then we disseminate them uh, to people all over the world, uh, and they send back pictures of themselves with their wave, and then we're going to combine them on our website so people can see evidence of, you know, an image, a picture that will resonate, hopefully, that, uh, you know, just and remind people that we are connected and that we should have the oceans on our mind at all times. Okay, so we've talked a lot Sorry if we got a little, uh, you know, academic there. A little help ourselves. <laughs> um, but now we're going to talk about the fun stuff. Our workshop, which is you. Where, where you guys come in. So your first assignment is to build a cairn. And uh, the one on the left is by an artist that we're going to be talking a lot about. And some of you may know of uh, Andrew Goldsworthy, who is kind of the iconic working with natural materials artist. Um, we like starting our workshops with a rock stack because it forces you, in order to balance, and this is very difficult to do, in order to balance something, you have to really kind of center yourself and it forces you to be in that natural environment for more than just a second. I'm the kind of person who likes to walk and, you know, I love the person who's doing laundry during this workshop. I think that's so cool. I want to do tw 20 things at once. And doing act for me forces me to stop, take a breath, hear what's going on around me, feel the wind, and just take a pause. Um, and it's, a, it's the perfect way to warm up. Um, if you are unable to go outside, uh, you know, which I think most of you are, but if you are, you can also do this exercise with household items. And you can also do cairns inside your house. I was thinking the other day, how cool would it be if you collected rocks with friends and your kids and then how many cairns could you build inside your bathroom like what would that look like or just piles of socks that'll, that'll work um but yeah, also, I had to if, you're somewhere, if you're somewhere there aren't a lot of rocks you can also try this with sticks yep really anything that's around you um it's more about the idea of centering and balancing Right. So this is like, we've got three assignments for you. That's the, pr these first two are kind of the pre warm up. So these will help you warm up. The second one 
this is using a technique Kristen was telling me about, like, I don't know about you guys. When I was little, I used to try to sew things together. I used to tie vines and gra mostly grass because I grew up in the Midwest. Um, but this uses leaves. There are plenty of leaves around right now. And Kristen, you were talking about the, the thorns as needles. Yeah, and we're going to um, give you guys a link to uh, a, a documentary called uh, Rivers and Tides by Andrew Goldsworthy. And that documentary is fantastic because you can really watch him working and he makes one of these pieces in that video. But the idea behind this piece and why we want you to try to make an object, not necessarily weave together leaves if you want to, but it's, it's the idea of thinking about the materials around you that may not, you may not associate with art materials, but that absolutely can be a sculptural material, but you have to play with them. You have to experiment. So we want you guys to find two materials and see if you can join them in some creative way. And with that joining, it be, we want you to think about, can the joining technique become part of the design? So you see the little sticks that have been used as pins, essentially, to pin these leaves together, um, become almost like a decorative pattern that's part of the form. And there's tons of things you guys could try. Like the one on the left is just, uh, you know, split up grasses that have been laid in an interesting design interacting with the stones. They're not necessarily connected, but they're connected visually. And then the one on the right um, is, you know, held together by balance and probably some mud. Mud is a great thing to experiment with um, because it acts adhesive. See. Also things, look at, look at what's around you. What, you know, we all know the adage that weeds are just plants nobody loves but a lot of those plants like down here we have some uh pest it's actually a pest called bindweed but it's a great connector and it's abundant look and see what's abundant what's extra you know some of this will be about how you choose to engage with the environment what do you want to use what feels okay to take what um uh, a lot of this is that you're going to need to slow down a little bit. This is not for the the quick instant answer, but it's very much about meditative contemplative time and, and play happy. like have fun, sit in a spot and see what's around you and see if you can put it together. Once you build your object, and it can be extremely simple or it can be complex. Yeah, this is super yeah. fancy. Yeah, this is super complex. Um, and if you want to try to build one of these or actually remake something that Andrew Goldsworthy made, um, that is totally great because sometimes it's hard to start and you can just take an idea and it will end up being your own original idea eventually. So if you're having trouble starting, you can pick one of these forms and try to duplicate it. Once you have your object, we want you to photograph it in different spaces. So take a picture like the one on the left of the object itself so we can really see it and then take your object and put it in at least five different spots. And some of them might be in the trunk of your car, or it might be on your head, or it might be in a tree branch. See what that object, how that object can transform a space when it is the, the most interesting focal point in that picture. And take more pictures than you think you need, because usually the one, you know, you need a couple to get a good one. The third project, do a site-specific installation. This so is the big one. Yeah, this is the big one. So those are the warm-ups. Um, and you can do all three or just one of them. It's, it's up to you. We're hoping that you're, you're willing to share some of the photographs. Failures are important because you have to fail in order to make cool stuff. Um, you'll get that from the rock stacking. You'll fail a lot. Um, but we hope you share the images with us that Nate is going to put up on the, the gallery site so that we can talk about them next week. But the third installation, you will go out, find a site that you like for some reason. And you're going to sit in that site for about five minutes without doing anything. You're just going to listen and think about it. Is there wind? Is there a special light? In this case, this was from uh, Caitlin. Uh, from this semester, my 3D class, um, I have them go out and do this project. Mm -hmm. And I thought she was particularly successful because she was able to take some very simple shapes and combine them. 
So she thought about the running river and the lines that appear in the water, and she responded to that by making this kind of circular eddy pattern with the sticks. And what makes it so successful is that the negative shapes around the background, like the shape of the rock, the shape of the water, those all become shapes that are highlighted because of her manipulation of the site and the introduction of that object. Lisa, so, you wanna yeah, say? A, a lot, yeah. Um, so when you identify the, the site that you want to choose, what you wanna do is you're gonna pick it by thinking about how you can either accentuate it or celebrate it. It's something that you're gonna feel a connection with. And if you don't, just start and then you'll feel the connection. Identify what you want the focal point to be, like where's the first place you want someone to look? And that's where you're gonna think about placing the work. And then when you're spending time with it, one thing you can do if you're feeling stuck is to make lists, like bring a notebook with you and you can just list words and phrases. You don't wanna, you know, you don't wanna write a novel or anything because then that becomes the artwork. You just wanna feel, literally sit and feel and contemplate how you might transform that site. Um, you also want to think about uh, with this project, it's really important to take at least three photographs, one up close, yes. one middle ground, and then one that shows even more of the site. Um, with, without all of the site in the image, it, does, it becomes less of a site-specific and a three-dimensional work than it does a 2D work. Um, and, and you also end up with three works of art out of one piece that you've made. And something to think about too is when you're creating this work, how do you want to create the contrast? Like here in this image, you see a lot of contrast and it's done both through color and texture. I wouldn't say this is line so much. Um, also shape, you know, we're sh right now you're looking at round things, but you saw the cairn. This is, this is just taking the organic material. Some of this, the one on the left takes a lot of time. The one on the right, that's a good long afternoon. And those are just wet leaves, you know, basically stuck on the branches and pasted. Yep, water um, is the adhesive essentially. Yeah, now, and it's also like dandelion glue, you know, you bust up a dandelion and stuff. I so to use that. some of the tips we have for you, because this can be a really um, hard thing to start with. To be successful, you, ha you the more successful pieces always have contrast in them because environments like these are really busy. And it's hard to appreciate the artwork um, within those busy environments. So you have to create a contrast color, like the one on the right, value, like darks and lights, like the one on the left. You need a really um, visible focal point so the, the viewer knows where to look. Um, because you also, Yeah, you can also play with proportion. Like, how does this space relate to the larger whole? Or scale, like is this something that's very large or very tiny that waits for to be discovered? Um, those are very large. <laughs> yeah, and and um, but when you make a small item, um, you the idea is that you can use the environment that it's in to make it much larger. So the one on the right is not a big piece, but because Andrew Goldsworthy chose that window to to focus in on the horizon line, all of a sudden the horizon line and the lake become your sculpture. So you can make a very tiny focal point, but have a mass sculpture just depending on where you put it. And something else to think about is repetition. Like all of these are fairly singular works, but you might have a whole series of things that draw the eye. Yep. And using, if you have water near you, water is really fun to work with because you can work with the reflection. So the one on the left is just an arch, but, but because he got lucky with the water having no ripples, he got the completed circle through the reflection. So here's, here's kind of an example of what Lisa Beth is talking about with the repetition. So the artist, and Andrew, has the contrast with the color also a really strong focal point not only with the red but also the dark circle in the middle and then the repeated form creates a rhythm with the leaves and if you look at the shape wait can you go back for all right sorry yeah okay the shape here you've got these spiky things in a really smooth environment 
uneven, nothing. And what's interesting is the leaves look more uniform than the stones around them. So that's something you can think about. Again, you don't necessarily have to overthink this. We're kind of just trying to give you as many options as possible. Right. And another tip is to really focus on one idea. So um, either shape or line or texture and then incorporating contrast in with that. So here's one that, the, so these are student works at USP, um, and I think they give you a good idea of what, you know, what you can do and how photos can really change things. So this one really focuses on shape, repetition, and line. And then the artist, this was a graphic design student, um, so I thought that was really interesting. I love getting the graphic design students getting their hands dirty outside, and they make some really amazing stuff. So a great photograph, um, and then just a little bit of an addition, and it changes the piece entirely. So this is this <laughs> this guy is a, a DJ in um, Seattle right now, but um, he did some really interesting pieces, and he didn't know where to start, so he he copied uh, one of Andrew Goldsworthy's ideas and, and late floated these leaves and he thought, I can do better. He's like, I can do better than that. So then he introduced these, these little circular designs. So that's a great example of, you know, start, starting with an Andrew Goldsworthy piece and then expanding upon it. So this these are about, I yeah, think this ahead. is about finding a space that already exists and just transforming that tiny space. So. Here the birch, although it looks like they might have altered the birch a little bit, but the one on the right, that was just a space that existed. It was an opening. Sometimes it's just about seeing what's there. Yeah, and just a, a word about conservation too. We don't want you to manipulate what's there. We we in a permanent or damaging way. So the one on the left um, actually was a crack in the tree that existed. Um, and and at this time of the year, um, things are growing. So we don't want to, and we don't want to like cut a branch. Um, if you're going to harvest sticks, there's plenty of dead sticks around that you can use. And then if you harvest leaves or grasses, that's not going to damage anything that um, you can prune will be fine. But we want to stay away from cutting branches because that can introduce, uh, you know, uh, like viruses into the tree. That's probably wrong, the wrong word, viruses, but it can damage. Parasite. Now, if you're doing yeah. this work in the fall and you know frost is coming, that's a great time to harvest branches. Or you can work with things like buckthorn or things that you want to get rid of, which we do a lot here. For us right now, the magnolia trees are blossoming, but they're also dropping leaves and um, some pods. So something to think about, like when I... It's a, I don't know if you've ever seen a magnolia pod, but it's bizarre and it's got a lot of openings and that it can be tiny. Like these are all fairly larger pieces, but it can be something as small as altering the pod and leaving it where somebody would find it. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I, I threw these images up there because the first instinct for a lot of people is to work on a flat surface, um, which can end up being sort of two dimensional instead of site specific. So the reason why I think a lot of people grab towards working on a flat surface is because we're used to drawing on paper, making art on a canvas, and that is an excellent way to start, even if you're, you know, especially if you're comfortable with that. But but the thing that you want to keep in your mind is what is unique about that flat surface. So in the case of the piece, this was a student work up on the left, um, which she started making these labyrinths in the snow at Tree Haven. And this is a lake there. For those of you who are familiar with Tree Haven, this is the lake down by the fire pit. Um, I, I can't remember which direction, but it's kind of near the one of the lodges. And um, she really wanted to incorporate the lines of the labyrinth with the line of the horizon and that sense of a huge space with the contrast of the dark trees. Um, and then this piece actually evolved into a real stone labyrinth that she did for Tree Haven. Um, the one on the right, uh, you know, wanted that micro experience where you walk up to the piece and you can see the detail of the braids and then when you step back you see how that spiral is kind of integrated and contrasting with the flow and the waviness of the grass. 
Um, snow is so great to work with because the, it's instant contrast with anything that you put. You can work with shadow. Shadow can be the primary focus of your piece. And the one on the left is just, um, you know, pine needles that have been moved around. Now, what I, why I put the one on the left is because that piece was transformed by the contrast of that tiny yellow, yellow leaf that's in the middle. Without that, it would be far less interesting. And the, the, she took another photo of that piece that had the lake in the background, and you can see how the spiral was kind of moving up the hill. And that piece was actually more successful than this one because you could see more of the site. Just another example of you know water being a flat surface that you can work with um, and also uh, I had a sculpture and a costume design student who was doing this project and she wanted to make a piece that she could both perform in as well as something that would operate on its own so here's a great example of two very different works of art but it is exactly the same work of art just photographed differently um, so the one uh, I included because if you have a down tree, they're usually pretty soft and easy to drill into. If you want to use mechanical tools and you have access to them, great. Um, you certainly don't need to. Most of my students don't. But this student wanted to make something a little more three-dimensional. So she drilled holes into the, the rotten tree, which was pretty easy, and then was able to just poke those branches in and create a really kind of sophisticated piece that was uh, quite beautiful and changed really in a beauty, you can't really see it here, but the shadows that this piece cast were really lovely. The one on the left was another graphic designer. He's actually, a, I think, a game designer now too. Um, and his interest was creating order out of a chaotic background. So he, he cleared away these squares as simple as he could. They're tiny, they're like three inches by three inches. Um, and then just photographed them so that that square became a really interesting photo or a focal point in the area and that the the uh, it just gave a great contrast with the background so hopefully some of this will also be a process of discovery for you about just kind of seeing what's around finding colors you haven't seen before looking at also look at the relationships between the natural elements what trees grow near what you know bodies what roots grow near what how does this plant interact with that plant is there a space in those inter between these things that are already there that can be something you interact with. So I threw this one in too um, for those of you who like to build. Um, some people want to get out there and they don't want to do something delicate. They really want to just build something, a structure. And willow and dogwood are really the most uh, useful for that project. They're super bendy. Um, and if you, if you harvest them, even at this time of year, they'll grow back twice as, um, twice as prolific, especially the, um, the willow. And cut uh, Yeah. Also. yeah. Yep. So and that's, uh, if you're interested in this process, I recommend looking at Patrick Dougherty's work. Um, he does a lot of sculpture with woven willow, uh, and uh, you know it really it's really easy kind of to build with. Um, I think I'm going to go back to this slide later. Um, this is a video of Michael Grab, who's kind of like the king of stacking stones. Um, it's a really great video. Maybe we'll end on it if we have a little time. But I will again make this, I'll, I'll send this link to you guys and you guys can watch it on your own or you can just look up Michael Grob on YouTube and there's tons of videos. Some are cheesier than others. <laughs> there's a lot of cheesy bit music in his videos, but um, it's just amazing to watch him do it. And I think it, it might inspire you before you start your stone stacking. Should we talk about weather? Yeah, um, I don't know about you guys. I'm checking the weather every day, every week. We've got a storm coming in that might be an interesting opportunity for change. I, you guys are just finally like starting to warm up a little bit, right? Yeah, finally. So just be aware, look at what's happening for the week. That might be something that you can collaborate with. Yeah, well, a lot of my students are like, well, I couldn't do my project on time because it snowed or it rained. And um, it, what I usually tell them is weather is an opportunity. It's, it's, 
and, and these are just simple rain shadows that Andrew made and uh, you guys could try that yourselves. And, and he, if you look online rain shadows, uh, you'll see all the different surfaces that he made them on and they're so easy and fun to do. Um, so don't be dissuaded by weather that you might think is bad. It could be the best thing for your work. So what we need to decide as a group is how, when and how would you like to reconvene? We're hoping that you'll be able to come back next Saturday so we can just look at your images and talk about the work. I don't want you to feel like you're just working into a void. Um, and whoever's available, we want to meet with you. It's yeah, we're really excited to see what you guys come up with. I want to see what Amelie comes up with. <laughs> um, yeah. And Rowan, especially the kids. I want to see can make I want you to uh, I want to see you put the adults to shame um, do you want me to just tell people where they can upload yeah that would be and can we also have an email because what we'd like to do is send you the assignment um, we've got it all written up and, and can send, email it to you I think I think we've got everybody's contact if you registered we've got your contact yeah I suppose if you send out the email and no, somebody in this call here doesn't get it, you can just shoot us a, a message at, at the ArtFest online website and we'll make sure that you get the information. We were uh, hoping, um, oh, sorry, Nate. We were hoping that no, you guys might be interested in, in doing 11 o'clock again next Saturday. If you, if you think that might work for you, can you give us a thumbs up? All right, and seeing, I'm seeing some people. So does I'm anyone <laughs> raise, your hand if, raise your hand if that's definitely a problem. Okay, Emmy, that's a problem for you? Oh no, it's good? Um, okay. What time right. is stuff happening on ArtFest Online on Saturday? Yeah, so remember. the only thing is there's a 10 o'clock event, um, which is the announcement of the LEGO uh, Story Festival, or the LEGO Story Contest winners. Um, I don't know how long that's going to go. I don't think it's going to, I, I, I can keep stuff on an hour for live stream events, um, but you may just end up having to kind of get into the, the Zoom call a little bit, you know, quarter after or something like that should be fine. So as long as you're okay with it kind of being a little 11-ish, then we should be fine. Well, we could do 11.30 just to be safe. Whatever works. Um, 11.30 would work just fine. And again, I, some of it is just if you're going to use my Zoom account, then I need to actually transition. So <clears throat> let's, um, let's do 1130 next Saturday. And how do people upload their photos? Like, how should we how do we do that? So I'm going to put a, a link in the chat here. Um, so you, you should get a little notification. Um, it's kind of a long link, so you don't have to remember all of that. But if you go to artfestonline.com and you click on galleries, um, and then there's under communal projects, you'll see environmental art gallery. And if you click on that, there's a link to submit it through a Google form. And basically any submissions that come in, I will then put into that gallery throughout the week. Um, and so uh, if you can't find that, um, you can also go to the workshop page um, where you signed up for this. And now instead of a sign up for the workshop, it says click to view the gallery. And so it'll take you right over there too. Um, that's awesome. perfect. And also if you guys want, if you're interested in sharing your email, you can put it in the chat box. I'll, uh, I'll download the file once we've got the full chat going. And, and if I you do have questions during the week too, feel free to email us. Um, I also wanted to say we have a, an individual artist contest um, with the grand prize being $200. Yay! And I would say if you're interested, the, the, the main parameters are um, that it has to be created this week, that it has to incorporate the ArtFest Online colors, which is just red, blue, and yellow, and however, whatever shade you want, whatever format you want. And then um, it has to center around the theme of blooming. Uh, so if you really, I mean, all of those would be very easily attainable by any of this environmental art sculptures that you might create this week. So if you do take a photo of that and you would like to also submit it to the individual artist contest, you can just submit it to both. You'll still need to submit it through the form uh, on the contest in order to qualify. 
Um, but if you want to just upload a photo to the, the main environmental gallery and then also to the contest, as long as it meets the requirements according to the contest rules, um, you'd be welcome to do that as well. Can it be any one of the colors or does it have to be all three? Um, for the contest, it does have to have some representation of all three. And you're welcome to interpret representation however you want. Okay. I'm not looking for the exact hues and the exact shapes. It's just the spirit of those three colors represented in some way within the work uh, in order to qualify for the contest. But obviously, for the um, for the the environmental art gallery, just it has to be environmental art. But there's no no other parameters. I'm assuming um, yes. to be included in that gallery. So and upload more than once. Do you know mess around and do some? I might even do a little bit just because I think it's kind of an interesting uh, art form so cool well the more the better and um, you know if you want some guidelines definitely take a picture of your rock stack with yourself and without um, take a picture of your object and in an environment like place it in different places and then take at least three photos of your installation but if you want to put more on there go for it you know, we'll be looking at all of them next week. So if you can have them put up maybe by late, like late, late, late Friday night, we can take a look. We'll sneak preview on Saturday morning so we can get our thoughts together and talk about them. You know, um, actually, I should I should probably revise that. We we probably can't handle like 50 images. So maybe shoot for like, you know, um, I don't know. What do you think is a good limit? Well, per you're going to have a minimum of, what you've got at least one for with you and your Karen, maybe one of just the Karen. You've got the object in one or two places, and then you've got at least you're going to have at least ten images, probably yeah. seven yeah. to ten. But I wouldn't do more than twenty. No, no, that's not necessary. Shoot for ten, but if you make more work and you want to include images of that work, go for it. But don't include every process shot. Like it should just be the final work. Yeah, and again, don't don't worry. We're going to send you a little message out about the steps for the assignment. So don't please don't feel like you have to have anything written down or memorized. And just a quick note about the image that you're looking at. This is a Scottish artist. Um, she put that circle out in a field. She lives up in the Upper Hebrides, Hebrides in Scotland, and she just documented what happened in that circle over the course of multiple months. So this is just a film still from her video of the documenting. A lot of environmental art, what's left is the documentation. A lot of the art is ephemeral. And that's kind of what's beautiful about it too, is that these are not permanent. Some are, but mostly not permanent forever things. They're much like us, we're just passing through. And, and we're essentially drawing a circle around you guys. And so our gallery is going to be um, basically the version of this artist's piece. We want to see what happens within that conceptual circle that we're drawing around you right now. Does anyone have any questions? Are you ready to make art? Make art! <laughs> Get dirty! Get really dirty. That'd be good. All right. Well, I think if there's no questions, um, we'll let you get at it. And uh, it Kristen, was. Uh, will you put your email in the chat so they have it? Um, oh yeah. Use. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, I probably, I think the easiest way to share the PowerPoint and the materials is, I will make a Google Drive and then I'll I'll email you guys a link so you have access to that. Um, and then. Uh, I'll put my email in if I can figure out how to do that. Just go down to the bottom where it says chat, click on that. Oh, I think just I... Just type your email in on the right. I'm gonna... If anybody else wants to, feel free. We've got your your registration <laughs> info, though. So that that's also... We've got uh, your emails that way. Okay, I'm having a hard time. Find... Can you send them my email? Is yeah, which one do you want me to use? Use the UW one. Okay. Yep. Give me one hot second. And I'm not seeing that thing. I've it's on the it bottom before. in the middle. It's not there for me. Um, don't worry about it. I got it. I got and we it. have your emails. Um, so yeah. we'll, that Google Drive will send to you. Cool. Thanks for your time. I know this is yeah. something a little different. And I hope that you'll um, 
give yourself the gift of being able to spend time outside. It's a beautiful time of year. We got lucky, I feel. I mean, spring's my favorite. There's so much growing. There's so much to see. There's so much, so much unexpected color. Things that you think are one color because you're taught to color them that way are usually not that hue. Um, they're beautiful textures. Watch yourself with the thorns. There are a lot of thorns right now. Yeah, and ticks. Yeah. So just just take care and enjoy. And you know what? You don't have to do any of this if you don't want to. It's all up to you. Nate, did and, you uh, no pressure. Yeah, well, I'm just going to put one last quick plug, if you didn't hear me at the very beginning, basically saying that this, this workshop is a part of a larger event called ArtFest Online. So if you go to artfestonline.com, we have a bunch of other events. They're all free. And the, the idea is exactly what uh, Lisa Beth was just saying of like, do it or don't like it's not like we're going to be offended if you don't do all of this stuff we're just trying to provide resources and get people excited about uh doing creative things and so we do we actually have three more workshops that are still open for registration two of them are later today and one is tomorrow and so definitely check that out on the website if you're interested uh, we have musicians playing all week um andrea uh who's here in this class my wife is uh, actually going to play solo flute um, over the dinner hour at 5.30 on Wednesday. So there's tons of music that's designed. To, again, it's not to have you like commit to something and to be present necessarily, but put it on in the background, sit out on the deck, enjoy the sunset, whatever you want to do. It's all about just uh, promoting creativity in any form. And so as long as you feel like, creatively inspired, we don't care if you don't even look at the website ever again. It's totally <laughs> fine. We just want to inspire people toward creativity. So... All right. Have good. fun, guys. Thanks again. Good to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Right.